I'd like to thank the uh, Center for Law, Technology, and Society, Open Air, and Jeremy and Chitty for this invitation. It is an honor for me to be here to speak to you this afternoon. And thank you all for coming to allow me to share my thoughts with you. Can you hear me in the back okay? Okay, perfect. I'm delighted to be back in Ottawa. As Chidi mentioned, I am Canadian. I'm also African. I trained in Canada, practiced law in Canada, and now I teach in the United States. I live in South Florida. So I'm coming from Miami to Ottawa. Normally people do the reverse. But uh, I was delighted to come back here. I thought it would be nice to enjoy some of the cold, fresh air. And I thought I was well prepared for winter in Canada because I had my coat, I had the boots, had the scarves. And I walked outside with no gloves and realized I was not prepared. So I had to shop yesterday. Now I'm back to enjoying the winter in Canada. So it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I, I'm going to talk to you about redefining intellectual property progress. I write on international intellectual property issues. I have a particular interest in the impact of intellectual property on society in terms of the social, the economic, and the cultural aspects. Now, I know that Open Air in, uh, has been doing projects relating to innovation in Africa. This particular talk will be focused on intellectual property and not necessarily innovation in the broader sense, because as we know, innovation can occur outside of the intellectual property context, but I'm going to be talking about intellectual property. I need to throw out a disclaimer that uh, the ideas expressed here do not represent the views of any organization with which I have been previously, previously associated or with, with which I am currently associated. The views expressed here are my own. Now, my current project asks, what does successful intellectual property policy look like for African countries? And how do we measure it? In order to measure it, we must go back to the purposes of intellectual property. My argument here is that human development must be recognized as an objective of intellectual property policy and as an aspect of intellectual property progress. Human development should be a metric for assessing the success of intellectual property policy. What I'm saying here is not revolutionary, but it's not mainstream. It's not revolutionary because I'm not the first to talk about intellectual property and development. Others have talked about intellectual property and development, scholars, activists, primarily when talking about wiggle room in trade agreements that regulate intellectual property and when talking about exceptions to intellectual property rights. The World Intellectual Property Organization has recognized the link between intellectual property and development through the, the development agenda. The World Trade Organization has recognized it. So has the World Health Organization. So I'm not doing anything new in linking development to intellectual property. However, it's not mainstream because human development has been overlooked as an objective of intellectual property, and therefore it has been overlooked as a metric by which we can assess the success of intellectual property. Now, by human development, I'm referring to factors such as those taken into consideration by the United Nations in their Human Development Index. So factors like health, right, life expectancy, education, things like literacy, and um, economic development, okay? So health, education, economic development. Currently, we measure intellectual property success in terms of the number of intellectual property filings. So we look at how much intellectual property are we producing, or we think of it in terms of um, the economic value of intellectual property. So if you look, for instance, at the World Intellectual Property Organization indicators, um, the Director General has said that IP is doing very well, right? We have an increase in patent filings. We have an increase in trademark filings. The system is being used, and this is a good thing. If we look at, for instance, um, stopfakes.gov, which is a US government website, 
um, when we, they talk about intellectual property, it's about the $512 billion in estimated lost sales due to piracy. So we're looking at the numbers in terms of the number of filings and in terms of the financial um, losses or gains with respect to IP. So this has become a bit of a numbers game, right? And others have noted this. I think um, even in the open air book about Africa, you guys have talked about this, about the fact that there's a bit of a numbers game. But what do all these numbers tell us about innovation or progress? So these numbers are important, but perhaps we overstate the case, particularly in the international context where there is no national court that will take into account domestic policy considerations. So in global intellectual property, human development is not currently treated as a priority. Some might say that human development is not the purpose of intellectual property, right? Intellectual property law and policy is not there to promote human development, but I disagree. And I would argue that nations should use human development as a way to measure the success of their policies. Now, why is this important for Africa? This is important for Africa because if you look at the continent and you look at the Human Development Index, many African countries fall towards the low end of the Human Development Index. Right? So towards the bottom of the category, we find Gambia, Sierra Leone, Guinea, Burkina Faso, a number of African countries, and Niger currently at the bottom of the 2015 Development Index. So human development is important for the African continent. My goal here with this project is to shift the framing so that we justify intellectual property laws and intellectual property policy because it is promoting human development rather than justifying health policy, as an example, as a limited exception to intellectual property. So human development should be the norm rather than the exception. I'm going to proceed by describing the problem, so I'll give you an example. And then I'm going to talk to you about intellectual property purposes, um, explaining a little bit about the utilitarian and natural rights framework. And then I'm going to explain to you how I see human development working as a metric, how I see using human development as a metric. <coughs> Is everyone here familiar with intellectual property? More or less? OK, so um, I'll just briefly, very briefly, um, because most people are familiar, just talk very briefly about what it is that I'm talking about with intellectual property. So patents, for instance, cover an invention, right? So you invent some new part for an airplane or some new drug, new useful, non-obvious, you can obtain patent protection. When we talk about copyright, we're normally, normally talking about the rights associated with literary and artistic works. So your book, for instance, your music that you listen to is covered by copyright. Um, Trademarks are indications of source. So trademarks, classic example would be something like Coca-Cola. Um, so you know that the stuff in the bottle is made by Coke. Or the Apple computer, right? So Apple is a logo, so that is a trademark, a source indicator. And then geographical indications, which are similar to trademarks, but which are indicators of source that are tied to geographic region. So I won't belabor the point um, that those are some examples of intellectual property. Um, the rights are held by individuals and by companies, so by human persons and by companies. They're generally time limited, and the nature of the protection varies. <clears throat> so what's the problem? So IP is everywhere. I'm starting by giving you an example relating to Australia, and I'm talking about Africa. Australia is clearly not an African country, right? But Australia is an example of a country that has recently had to defend its objectives related to human development, its health policy, as against an intellectual property right held by a company. So I'm giving you Australia as an example. And I think Australia, as a highly developed country, underscores the point as to why this is important for African countries. So smoking kills, we know that. But some decades ago, this is how smoking was advertised, right? Smoking was glamorous, smoking was fun, smoking was cool. 
right? But we know smoking kills. Australia has banned smoking in public places, as we have here in Canada. And um, the World Health Organization has uh, a smoke-free initiative where they're encouraging countries to take measures to discourage smoking to protect public health. And I'll just give you a quote from the World Health Organization. They remind us that tobacco products, so quote, tobacco products are the only legally available products that can kill up to one half of the regular users if consumed as recommended by the manufacturer. Okay? So in this context, a policy decision by Australia to restrict smoking or limit smoking is not unusual. They recognize it's the single largest cause of preventable death and so they wanted to discourage smoking. And Australia's strategy <coughs> is graphic. Um, Australia's strategy is unappealing, right? And Australia's strategy is effective. Other countries want to do the same. It's effective because it's graphic and it's unappealing. So naturally, the cigarette manufacturers are not happy because promoting human health is not good for the tobacco industry. So this doesn't end with a, an unhappy corporation, right? This becomes a conversation then about the company's right to use its trademark versus Australia's right to protect the public health. Now, prom promoting public health, which is a measure of human development, so health is a measure of human development, promoting public health is important for Australia. And Australia currently stands at number two in the Human Development Index rankings. So Australia we can treat as a country that's at the very top of human development. Yet it's still important for Australia to promote human development, to promote human health, and they've implemented the law to do so. So human development is important for Australia. How much more critical for African countries? And Australia has found itself engaged in litigation with the cigarette industry defending its laws that are designed to promote public health because the companies are concerned that they cannot use their trademarks as in the way that they would like to use their trademarks. So the conversation has become one about trademarks versus health. And I ask, why is this even the conversation? Why is this even the conversation at all? Human development should be, must be one of the standards by which we measure the success of IP policy so that policies that are designed to promote human development are not put on the defensive, right? We don't want to see this kind of thing where you have children smoking. Ideally, you catch them when they're young and they continue until they're much older. So this brings me back to the purpose of IP. What does this promoting innovation, what does it all mean in relation to human progress. What does it mean in relation to human progress? And I've given you the Australian example. I'm sure we can all think of different examples where some sort of human development interest intersects with IP, whether we're talking about uh, patents over seeds or access to medicines. There are various examples and examples that might be pertinent to the African continent. But the point is that even countries that are highly developed countries like Australia have to fight for this. So coming back to the purpose of IP, we say that intellectual property is critical to fostering innovation. This is some of the language that's out there. It's critical to fostering innovation. We want to make sure that individuals reap the benefits of their inventions and their creations. We want to make sure that we have cultural creativity and vitality. So I'm going to speak to you briefly about the, the two main justifications that are out there for intellectual property rights. So there is the utilitarian, there are the utilitarian theories and then natural rights. Those are the two main theories that are out there. Um, some might dispute that, but those are the two main camps. That's how I'm categorizing them. And the predominant one is utilitarianism. Now, under the natural rights framework, we rationalize intellectual property protection as some sort of reward to the creator, right? They're entitled to the fruits of the labor. You have mixed it with your labor, and therefore now it is yours. So a Lockean approach, right? And um, 
There's also the idea that intellectual property is an extension of the person. So that would be a personality theory to intellectual property. And natural rights theories could promote human development to some extent. We might argue that the creator is able to express him or herself, that they can make a living from their work, and so there are some human development aspects to that. The downside with the natural rights approach is that you end up with a dispute about rights versus right. So maybe the right to use my trademark versus your right to health. And even in the absence of a, a natural rights approach being the predominant approach, we see that intellectual property rights tend to win in this tug of war. The utilitarian approach, which is the predominant approach, focuses on the, the um, innovation, the, the need to stimulate innovation. And um, this approach has been criticized because of its focus on maximizing wealth. So we've tended to, in utilitarianism, equate intellectual property success with wealth maximization. The advantage of the utilitarian approach is that you can say there's a particular objective. We want to stimulate innovation. It's not being met, so we need to curtail the intellectual property protections in that instance. And that's what some of the access advocates have tended to do. My question is whether we think about it from a natural rights perspective or from a utilitarian perspective, why are we rewarding the individual? We reward the individual because we value the contribution that they're making. Why do we want to stimulate innovation? Because we want more creative and innovative works. But why? Ultimately, it's because we think it is a contribution to humanity. Improving the human condition is an end goal that should explicitly be recognized in intellectual property policy and in the interpretation of intellectual property obligations. It should be one of the metrics. And this is particularly important for African countries. Now, I'm arguing that we should redefine intellectual property progress, and I recognize that it is easier and it is cleaner if intellectual property policy does not attempt to respond to difficult ethical questions about accessing food, restricting content, patenting life. It is easier and cleaner if we say that these issues should be addressed by a different legal regime or they should be addressed through exceptions to intellectual property. But this ignores the reality that intellectual property laws can impact positively or negatively on some of these difficult social, cultural, ethical issues. My approach might be messier, but I think it more accurately reflects the reality. Innovation, progress, intellectual property progress. What am I talking about when I talk about innovation? I'm using innovation in the broadest sense of the word, the simple dictionary definition of innovation, right? The Webster's dictionary definition of immigration, of innovation, sorry. Just the introduction of something new. <coughs> and progress. Again, in the broadest sense of the word, just the process of improving or developing something over time. It is my contention that intellectual property progress must mean human progress as well. The innovation, the progress, for the purpose is for the purpose of improving the human condition, not for the purpose of promoting corporate interests. The innovation and the progress is for the purpose of improving the human condition. You can say this all sounds very theoretical, but what difference does it make? We have exceptions to intellectual property, and individuals and nations can avail themselves of those exceptions and those flexibilities. It makes a difference because my goal is 
to effectively shift human development from the periphery where it must be defended and justified to the center where it must be advanced. We want to move human development from the periphery to the center where it must be advanced. The Human Development Index recognizes that economic progress alone is not an adequate measure of progress. Using human development as a metric means that promoting human development will not require asking for an exception to the norm. Human development should be the norm so that we can proactively develop intellectual property policies that promote the multifaceted aspects of human development. So the economic aspect is still there. Health, promote health, promote education, promote literacy. The African Union has an innovation strategy. And I think the African Union innovation strategy is a step in the right direction. The African Union innovation strategy has innovation and human development as its main goals. The African Union underscores the importance of socioeconomic growth, reducing poverty, achieving food security, promoting public health, and the environment. And this is a step in the right direction. The Doha Declaration was also a step in the right direction. And I have to go back to the World Trade Organization agreements. The World Trade Organization agreements are important and they're foundational because the WTO was the first to harmonize intellectual property around the globe. And even though we're talking nowadays about the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement and other more recent agreements, the TPP still refers back to the WTO. So these are foundational agreements and they're important. Now, the WTO agreements struggled with development from early on. When the agreement on intellectual property was implemented, there was a delay for developing countries. There was a delay a delayed implementation period for least developed countries, and least developed countries have had to ask for extensions of time twice now. And I believe the extension is until 2021 for some aspects of the implementation. So the struggle with development has been there from the beginning. Doha, paragraph four, I say is a step in the right direction. Because the Doha Declaration takes a step towards recognizing human development, though not explicitly recognizing human development as an objective. But I would go a little bit further than Doha. But Doha has WTO members agreeing that TRIPS does not and should not prevent me uh, members from taking measures to protect public health. Doha affirms that the agreement can be interpreted and implemented in a manner supportive of the right to protect public health. Health is one measure of human development. But to be more explicit, human development as an objective of intellectual property would change some of what's said here. Because I would argue that if we put human development at the center, even without using the measures that provide flexibility, intellectual property policy should promote human development. Again, not as an exception, but as the norm. Right? When we talk about flexibility, it implies that there's some standard and we're somehow deviating from that standard. Is it practical? Is it feasible to use human development, to use the human development index? Is it practical, is it feasible, or is this just a theoretical talk? It is practical, it is feasible. Some authors recently engaged in an empirical study using the human development index to measure the effect of piracy on human development in a number of African countries. And they, in, partic in particular, they 
measured the effect of piracy on economic prosperity, on life expectancy, and on literacy. Now, when you use human development, it doesn't necessarily mean that you will have more IP or less IP. So in their study, for instance, they found that piracy promoted literacy, but piracy did not have a positive correlation with economic development. But you could take something like that and tweak copyright policy, for instance, to promote human development based on whatever findings you might achieve from your study. To conclude, I have four points that I would like you to take away, if you will. I've argued first that intellectual property should be measured in terms of its contribution to the human development goals and not primarily in terms of revenue generated or number of annual patent or trademark filings. I have argued to redefine intellectual property progress to recognize human development as an objective of intellectual property policy and to use the human development index or some similar tool as a measure of its success. Secondly, human development can be used in, under the utilitarian framework as an objective by which to measure. In a natural rights framework, we could use human development as a guideline when we're prioritizing conflicting rights. And in this way, human development as a metric puts human interests, individual or community, at the core of IP policy. Thirdly, in terms of the effect this approach, I've argued, moves human development from a defensive position where it has to be justified through flexibilities and exceptions. And if it is clear that human development is part of the intellectual property objectives, it might shift the interpretation of substantive provisions in intellectual property agreements so that public policy that is designed to promote some aspect of human development is less likely to be perceived as inconsistent with our intellectual property obligations. Fourth and finally, this is important. It's critical for African countries, but not just for African countries. Human development is important for Australia. Australia has been having to fight to defend its laws. Human development is important for Canada. Canada has found itself on the defensive a couple of times in terms of justifying Canadian approaches to pharmaceutical, the pharmaceutical industry, for instance. So human development affects everyone. African countries need to become part of the global intellectual property system. But all countries need human development friendly intellectual property laws and policies. Thank you for your time. I welcome any comments, criticisms, suggestions that you may have. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much for a wonderful and <coughs> informative discussion. Uh, we want to open the floor up for questions. So if you have a question that you'd like to ask, please make yourself known and we'll try to work through as many as possible in the amount of time we have provided. Okay. Uh, member here. Uh, so I'm just wondering if you think that current IP legislation needs to include some sort of um, section on human development saying your IP can't compete in development. In or whether it's just going to be an unwritten expectation. Thank you. That's a good, good question. Um, I think that should be up to individual countries. Um, you know, if you look in the, the U.S. context, for instance, the U.S. Constitution speaks about promoting progress, the progress of science and the useful arts. 
uh, Canada doesn't have a constitutional provision like that that speaks explicitly to IP policy or IP regulation. And I think that basically, if there, there are two ways I would see us approaching this. One, as an interpretive tool, countries might want to express explicitly say something, but I wouldn't want to say that it should not that IP should not impede human development. Because I think the the problem with saying just what we've said in Doha, and Doha again was a step in the right direction, but it does not prevent you from taking measures, it still puts it on the defensive position. So, yeah, maybe countries would want to be explicit in saying that the IP policy should promote human development, but even if it's not explicitly there, I think it's important to have it as part of our understanding of what IP does, and not just what countries expressly state. In part because we have the WTO agreements, but as you know, we've moved on since then, right? There are all kinds of bilateral free trade agreements. There's the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement. There's the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. There's the TTIP. It just on and on and on, right? And so you have intellectual property in these different agreements. And so I think it's an important theoretical shift to make. And of course, if countries put it in writing, then it helps to make the case in terms of um, countries' understandings and in terms of customary international law, if it becomes the norm over time. But I think both, both approaches could work. I hope that answers your question. Why do you believe at this point human development hasn't been a main objective of IP? And do you believe to any extent that it's a matter of maintaining control over cultural development? What do you mean by cultural development? In terms of it being or more so IP is meant for corporations and meant for larger mm. countries of the Western civilization is what I'm asking. Mm. Well, they might want us to believe that, <laughs> but I don't think that is the case. Um, <coughs> that's a, a great question. Uh, why do I think that human development has not been at the core? I think that if we look even at some of the litigation that countries have had to engage in, the litigation alone tells us that human development is, has not been at the core. The Access to medicines um, movement tells us that human development has not been at the core. So to, to answer your question very briefly, when countries have been brought to the WTO over IP, and the question becomes, is it about the, the right of the patent holder, for instance, to uh, prevent others from using versus public health, the tendency has been to just look at what, are the, what is the economic impact, right? So we see it in terms of the litigation. We see it in terms of the on the ground, right? So countries will take measures like um, South Africa when they were trying to uh, make HIV drugs available um, quickly and easily and at a low cost, the companies jump on it. Um, I mean, there are just so many instances. I could go on and on and on, but basically you have a lot of acts, you have activists, and scholars responding to this idea that intellectual property rights have become too strong, that it's out of balance. There's a lot of literature um, about the TRIPS flexibilities, and I think the TRIPS flexibilities conversation is even a response, a reaction to the fact that we don't see human development as part of what's happening in intellectual property. And I'm gonna flip you to, I actually have TRIPS Article 7 here. Um, you know, the, the fight to have Article 7 as part of the TRIPS and <coughs> commentators referring to Article 7 all the time when trying to create greater balance is also an indicator that we don't see human development at the center. We'll say, oh, but look at the objectives of TRIPS. Look at Article 7 and 8. It has to be to the benefit of users and producers. It has to be something that is balanced. Fine. We refer to Article 8, which I also have here. The interesting thing about something like Article 8 is that at the end it says, you know, it says that you can do what you want to promote public health, but it has to be consistent with the provisions of the agreement. And then what does that really mean, right? If IP is about promoting the economic interest, then that's only one aspect of human development. As to whether or not um, it's just, you asked whether it's, 
a matter of control over culture. One of the things that is important to me is to recognize that there's a north-south problem. But I gave you Australia as an example, and I talked to you about Canada because it's not just a north-south problem. Okay, so Australia is fighting major corporations. Canada ends up fighting with major corporations. So yes, it's an issue for developing countries, but it's also an issue for everybody else. So I'm not sure that it's a matter of cultural control. Um, I think Susan Sell uh, documented pretty well how the WTO agreement came about and the influence of corporations there. We've, I've seen also quite a bit about the influence of corporations in the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. And when you read some of the IP provisions, you can see what the interests are that are being served. So is IP just for corporations? Absolutely not. Um, so to me, it comes back to that question of why do we want to stimulate innovation and creativity? It's to improve the human condition, not to improve corporate profits. Sure, corporate profits are part of it. Money's not a bad thing. That's part of it. It's just not the whole story. So I would refuse to accept that idea that it's about, that IP is for the corporations, and not for everybody else. It's for everybody. And I think we need to reclaim that. <clears throat> so I just have a question uh, in regards to kind of selling it to the other side, so selling it to yeah. the Wall Street to the world. Uh, we hear a lot about corporate social responsibility, yeah. and there's a lot of uh, academics and even like Bill Clinton speaking for the Clinton Foundation said that he pictures a world in the future where it's all social investors, where you know the corporations are going to be judged on their actual responsible actions. So. I'm just wondering that other than kind of the push of activist investors, can you see any other trends that we might be able to actually have it that it's not about the value of IP, but it's about the actual social development aspect of it? I think that there's a lot of work being done now by scholars exploring why people create and thinking about uh, what it is that we want out of the IP system. So I think some of the work that comes out of there could be helpful. Uh, as you were speaking, and thank you for your question, I, I just kept thinking Bernie Sanders, Bernie Sanders, right? Who would think that somebody who calls himself a democratic socialist would become so popular amongst the Democratic Party in the United States? So obviously there, there's a segment of the population that um, feels that that whole corporate control resonates. And so um, the corporate social responsibility uh, movement, I think, has taken off to a large extent. Um, so I don't know that it would take a lot to sell it. <coughs> I think that as long as it's not um, necessarily that companies feel they're going to lose, because the classic argument is, if we have to give stuff away for free, we're not going to make it. And I'm not arguing that stuff should be given away for free. Right? It might be that in some instances, when you're looking at the human development objectives, maybe you might have stronger IP protections. So it's not, a, it's not necessarily an automatic loss for the corporations. So do you think that um, one of the impediments to incorporating human development, or that your argument, um, is maybe kind of the, uh, the monopolistic, you know, capitalist, um, control of IP um, within certain industries, i.e. the pharmaceutical, in the part of pharmaceutical industry. Because um, I personally think, you know, if we kind of break that up, those monopolies down, um, we can kind of <coughs> create a sort of more, uh, a more, or I guess, redefine the progress in a sense, as opposed to, to, you know, limiting it to the control of certain, you know, major corporations. Mm -hmm. So your, your question is whether or not, you're suggesting that the industry is anti-competitive, for instance. Yes, yeah, it's and so anti-competitive. So if we're supposed to foster this uh, environment of, um, of creativity, how is that kind of the case when it's controlled by a few, few industries, or sorry, few companies, right? Mm -hmm. And when someone does release, you know, or comes up with something new, they're either bought out by these big corporations, and it's kind of, you know, a backward system in a sense where 
how, how, how do we, you know, foster creativity when it's this kind of system? Great point. I, I think that's a, I think that's a real, I haven't thought of that at all. Uh, it's a very interesting point, actually. And uh, I think that, you know, there's some, something there. Um, and I think about the, those who write about the, the fact that the, the garage inventor is no longer, right? So we romanticize what happens in IP, and really it's not just individuals creating in this kind of way. It's a lot of corporate control. Um, and so that is an interesting uh, point. I don't have an answer for you, but it's something I will think about further. Thank you. So um, in terms of framing, I, I want you to uh, let me know why the idea of mainstreaming human development, which is really the thesis of your thought, is different from what I consider to be still the mainstream debate in IP between balancing public and private interests. So is it a matter of conception or emphasis? Because the, the point I wanted to, 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 to let you know is that if we stick to balancing public and private interests, which is a perennial issue in intellectual property law and policy. Mm -hmm. I think embedded in that is this idea of mainstreaming human development. And, or would you suggest that the, 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 the framing you have adopted has something more to add to, to the very important debate of private public interest in, in intellectual property? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, that is a, a great question. I think that there is something different about mainstreaming human development. Um, the, the sort of the balancing, right, which is what we, we talk about, the users and the producers, um, the public versus the private, is slightly different because I'm arguing that whether we, whether we talk about sort of the, the individual sort of natural rights or the utilitarian, what are we doing for the public, we can still look at human development as a metric. And I think that, I mean, part of my problem with, with the, the, just the balancing is that I find that somehow IP still seems to win, right? Because we have to think about how are we going to do that balancing. And so one of the things that I suggested is that even when we're prioritizing interests, that we have to have something that's a guidepost. And I'm suggesting human development as a guidepost. I think a lot of times, in IP analysis were guided by the economics. And so that's only part of it. So we're balancing it, but what are we used to balancing it? So even if you said balancing, I'd still say use human development as the, the central thing that we're using to, to balance. Does that respond to your question? Thank you. Um, I'm actually, in the same vein as the question that we raised earlier, I, I was interested in the uh, example you gave about the study on piracy, which is basically infringement of uh, IP rights, um, and how it had led to uh, increased education, but not necessarily sharing increased economic um, indicators. What is interesting is actually perhaps also that parallel to this thing, there ought to be some sort of a rethinking of a series of economic equations and what we put in those equations to determine success and to measure success. Because I would suggest that, you know, increased literacy in long term probably had also dollar values attached to that. That is also measurable, but it's not measured. If we're looking at quarterly um, uh, changes to our stock, it's a different business than if you're looking at a 20, 30 year time frame. And I think that it, uh, this discussion seems to go hand in hand with rethinking the economic measurement tools and elements that go in it. Mm -hmm. I was wondering uh, whether that piracy um, basically uh, study was time limited. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a great point, and, and I think it was time limited. I mean, they looked at a number of African countries, and um, I can't remember the exact time frame, but certainly you could see how if you improve literacy and health outcomes that down the road it's going to improve the economic indicators. So certainly they feed one another. Um, I think that you would also see that, that people who have stronger economic uh, 
uh, situations also have better health and more literacy. So it's the cycle. But I think that definitely is a, a very good point that I'll take note of. And speaking of that, that same study and the, the parallel between literacy and piracy, isn't there a solution in some form of uh, strong IP but still open, like open access, open content, open educational resources, and things like that? Yeah, perhaps. And I, th I think that that's exactly the kind of thing that one would then think about and say, okay, we see it's good for literacy, so maybe we want to have some sort of open access to some extent. Yeah. So it's a great point. Thank you. Um, excuse me. Kind of along that same vein, I was just wondering how, how do you how do you sort of measure this in, in a way that clearly indicates causation? Like how do you how do you find a way to say um, this change in IP rights has increased health outcomes? Um, like the great thing about economic indicators that things are so clearly measurable. How do you define something comparable? Well, you know, it's interesting that you say that because I. I I'm not an empiricist, first of all, as a disclaimer. Um, but I do find that people, we, we tend to assume that economic indicators are very clear and straightforward. But when you talk to economists, I think that's actually quite debatable, right? So they even will argue amongst themselves as to what the, the indicators mean and how to assess the study. So I'm not sure if the, the premise is, is accurate. Um, but again, um, it's not my it's not my area. I will defer to the economists. The the second point um, that things like health and um, education literacy are not measurable. I would just say that they they have been measured, and so I would suggest to you that there is a way to measure it. Um, so perhaps you would look at uh, a situation where. Uh, it's not easy to access materials because maybe they're either mostly online or protected by technological measures um, and therefore people are not able to access those materials and so the literacy rate in the, in the community may not be as high. Right? I think there's a way that one could measure that and it would take some amount of time but I think you could measure it. Um, just the same way people have done studies about the impact of pharmaceuticals and the relationship between patents and pharmaceuticals and they might say it's not just about the patents it's the distribution chain so I'm not sure that we can't make the connection um, and you know this particular study that I found how how well was it done what were the parameters I don't know I can't speak to that simply to say that it is possible to measure and that's why I recommend something like the Human Development Index I didn't come up with it. It's there. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's already a tool that is used to measure human development. I'm going to steal Chair's prerogative because I've been eagerly waiting. Um, I see a lot of parallels with this uh, and the team, the ecosystems uh, and uh, natural capital evaluation that, that where they were trying to develop out of the CBD, trying to establish a mechanism to provide value to natural capital so that they're able to link what the legal infrastructure is <coughs> and what the outcome document would be. Uh, and what the overall positive benefit to society would be. So I think that, uh, that you are noting a uh, very, very valid uh, alignment to the, the Human Development Index as a component. Uh, the questions are, do you think that there's enough flexibility provided to, or deference provided to domestic jurisprudence uh, to be able to implement a measure like this in alignment with your GATT obligations or maybe exceptions under GATT 20? Uh, do you see a regional approach be it under the, the AU innovation guidelines as something that would provide a, a greater uh, protective measure for developing countries who are trying to take a more innovative interpretive approach? Um, yeah, thank you for that point and the question as well. Um, <coughs> I think, again, that I, I think your question is whether or not the international agreements would allow countries to do that, right? To, to make human development central. And by my argument, I would say that um, yes, they, 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 they do, they should, but it comes down to how do we interpret these obligations. And the, uh, the Canada case in 2001 with the stockpiling of generic drugs was pre-DOHA. What's interesting is that we haven't had another um, dispute that has gone to a panel and given us a decision post Doha. So I think it'd be interesting to see how any um, 
sort of uh, human development type policy would be interpreted in the post-Doha context. But I would argue that it should. That is my argument. Absolutely. At the very back. My question is, how can we, uh, sorry, I can make my voice louder. How is it possible to make this implicit human development, which is at the periphery, to be brought back to the center and more explicit what strategies can be used? Maybe uh, to what extent the human rights and IP discourse? And so that's the why for development happened and the other similar issues can be used to bring you back this issue from the periphery to the center. <coughs> the objective, or maybe one of the major objectives of IP. My worry is that in the Western uh, countries, particularly where the corporates are very much dominant and aggressively fighting for protection of their intellectual property and making that even harder to be incorporated in the least developed countries and coming where it's a lot objective and integrated. Uh, how can we change this scenario? Uh, and what strategies do you recommend to redefine and make human development an objective of I and my another question is to what extent can we even rethink of the utilitarian theory, which is meant to ensure uh, welfare for the public at large and carve out human development from that utilitarian theory, which the corporates and IP holders themselves are even uh, promoting as objective of IP. Well, uh, I think that's a very important question, right? How do you make change, basically, is what you're, you're asking. And I think that you have to have long-term strategies and short-term strategies. Uh, and this would be part of a longer-term strategy, right? T t attempting to shift how we perceive what intellectual property policy should be doing. Uh, as I said to you, I think the African Union innovation strategy is a step in the right direction. And part of what we, we need to do is not let one side define the debate, right? So if the, if, it's, if the debate is being defined as intellectual property, and I get the sense in the room that people see IP as being something for the corporations or managed by the corporations or controlled by the corporations for the benefit of the corporations, just take that back and say, no, it's not just about the corporations. It's about the people. And IP is something that is here to benefit all of us indivi individually as and as a community. Um, because I think what's happened is that the framework was structured in a particular way and developing countries are pushing back, I would say, fairly effectively. India, for instance, has pushed back effectively. Um, Brazil has been active in pushing back. You see developing countries pushing back on traditional knowledge, for instance. And let's not forget that developing countries are the majority of the world. Also, it's important, I would say, to remember that, again, developing countries might need to push back and strategize in a particular way, but there are interests in, developing con in developed countries that are very much in alignment with the interests in developing countries. And so it's important not to forget that. Um, maybe part of the problem is who's at the table, but uh, a lot of noise has been made, for instance, about TPP. I was not involved in any of that. I don't know how many changes were made as a result of the noise that was made in TPP. I do see some of the, the language, the, the flexibilities language from TRIPS in TPP. So some of those, what we think of as safeguards, are carrying through. Um, so I don't know if that answers your, your question fully, but I think it's about being informed and choosing to define on a national basis what do we think the IP sh policy should be doing and then make the arguments at the international level. And I'll just say one last thing about that. So India, I thought, was very effective in the... Um, India had, a, de had a, a dispute with respect to the uh, generic drugs that were seized in transit through Holland. And what I found interesting about the Indian argument is they made reference to the Doha Declaration and the TRIPS flexibilities, but what they also did was say, what you're doing is extending your patent right further than it needs to go. You explain yourself. That was settled, right? So 
it didn't, we didn't get any sort of explanation of, or analysis, but I thought that was a, an effective strategy. So put those that are insisting on using the IP in a non-human development friendly way, put them on the defensive and not have human development on the defensive. Hi, so I, I'm going to have a little bit of a devil's advocate question, mostly because I just actually want to hear your argument against it. Um, so one, one of the cited examples that I'm often <coughs> hearing from, from companies, from business people advocating for IP, um, the traditional class, classifications of IP. Um, you said there, there's no more garage inventors. Well, what people are telling me is the case of Dyson. Right, so Dyson comes up with this new type of vacuum with a, with a clear cylinder, so you can see he patents it. He tries to sell it to a whole bunch of big companies. They all tell him no. And then they start copying it. So he sues them and gets lots of money. And with that money, he then bases his business and starts selling it and is now, of course, a big hit. Now, of course, with developing country context, I'm thinking especially of clean cook stoves, right? So there's plenty of competitions, both charities and non-charities, backyard inventors trying to come up with clean cook stoves for developing countries. So they're often the ones telling me, well, if you want this to come about more quickly, because charities will find it eventually, then you need to respect traditional classifications of IP. So what should I be saying to them? <laughs> so, great. Uh, the garage inventor, so that myth, I mean, that stuff that people have written about. And actually, with your point, I think maybe it's more, uh, maybe that's a more accurate uh, story in the Western context. Maybe it's not. I don't know. But again, I would say that putting human development at the core doesn't necessarily mean less IP. There may be instances where you'd say, oh, no, we need the IP regime and we need it in this particular way because it's going to stimulate innovation in this particular kind of setting. So I'm not arguing against intellectual property. I'm not saying we have to have less IP rights. Sometimes maybe we do and sometimes maybe we don't. I'm just saying that when we're looking at intellectual property policy and developing it, we should develop it with a view to human development. And then when we're interpreting these obligations, these international obligations, we should interpret them with a view to human development. So for your, your inventors, or, or, uh, I would say, yeah, great, let's have IP, let's make the IP system work for them, right? And so I think that even some of the studies that, um, that I've been reading and some of the work and the, the projects from Open Air have recommended actually using the intellectual property system more in ways that will advance African countries and certain communities that are not using it. So it can be used in a good way. Okay. Um, I think it's also important to, to, to clarify that, you know, there's more of a conversation in developing country, you know, Context around, um, you know, their respect for IP. Then, you know, the extent to which they want to, you know, try and, you know, push back against developed countries and corporations, um, and and that conversation includes, you know, the idea that intellectual property rights enforcement can reassure international companies that their IP will be respected, and that in turn provides an incentive for them to invest in the country. That's one idea that's in, in the theory. And countries want that investment yes. uh, because they want the jobs and they want the growth that come with that. So they're willing to take on the IP and the potential infringement on other public policy goals in an effort to attract that investment. Um, the other thing that I've read is that um, you know, the, 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 the countries themselves, and depending on their, their income level, this is certainly true for more uh, middle income countries, have an interest in trying to unlock the innovative potential of their own citizens and companies. So IPR benefits them domestically, and that's one of the arguments that's made by developed countries in international trade negotiation contexts. So the counter argument is typically that for poor countries, uh, they benefit more from the ability to copy technology than they do from the secondary effects of IPR uh, protection and enforcement. So that's why I think the study that you referenced is actually a little bit disturbing, okay. because one would expect that for poor countries, piracy would benefit from that copycat effect and you'd see an economic growth. Um, which pays for increased investment in education and health and other public policy 
the objectives. Um, you know, the, the impact on literacy is encouraging, but literacy is also, of course, improved by more schools and better teachers and things that have to be paid for by economic growth. So I think it, my point is that we really need better evidence around which of the public policy approaches to IP is most beneficial for developing countries. Um, because they do want, you know, <coughs> increased wealth that allows them to pay for health education and so on. And that, you know, that comes from foreign sources um, in many cases. Yes, that's, that's true. Um, thank you for that point. Um, I would just say that it, it's an open question. I think really the policies that should be implemented must be tailored to the particular country. But the fact is we're still dealing with these international treaties and they're not going away. So we have to look at how do we interpret the obligations under the treaties. The other thing is there are, very, there are very few studies with respect to the effect of intellectual property in developing countries and in African countries. There's not a lot of, uh, there are not a lot of studies. And so I think that is a, a completely valid point. We do need more empirical work to tell us what's actually happening. So I wonder, when you talk about the, the investment, and that's the argument that's out there, you need to investment, you need to protect IP so that this investment will happen. And I wonder how much this investment is really happening and how much this investment is really stimulating development in some of these countries. If there's a success story to point to, I'd love to know it. I, I just am not aware. Uh, because it's been several years that we've, been, we've heard this same story. So and maybe it's working somewhere. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not aware. One last question. Um, I, it's actually a comment. I think that uh, the Dyson, uh, they weren't as small an entity as we would like to think because to just be able to bring themselves to the even first level of trial, they would have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars. So with all due respect, I think we are talking about different issues altogether. Yeah, maybe they weren't part of the big league of the billion dollar industry, but, um, you know, we are not talking about small innovative garage type things where you actually see the genius coming out. Um, also, if I may, I, I want, you know, you started by saying what you're uh, suggesting here is not revolutionary, but thinking about it, if you really are thinking of putting human development at the core of the objectives that are carried through throughout all these international agreements as the things that such as seven and eight of trips to, to that allow you to actually uh, you know follow through the, with those objectives and if you put human development at the core of that, essentially you are creating a little bit of a rebellion in the sense that you are giving the countries their right to essentially self-determination of the standards of trips. I'd love to see more about your paper. <laughs> Okay, so maybe it's revolutionary, I don't know. Um, but the comments and questions have been excellent and thought-provoking. Thank you very much for all your feedback and reaction. And thank you for staying and listening to, to my ideas. I appreciate it.